Hello, everyone, and welcome to our session at Microsoft Ignite. You have made it to getting started, or get started rather, with Power Apps. Thanks for joining us. Yes, my name is April Dunham, and I'm a senior developer advocate here at Microsoft. And I'm Greg Herman. I'm a senior power platform advocate at Microsoft. A little bit different, but really mostly the same, depending on who, who pays us. Anyway, let's go ahead and get started. We are inside our one of our Learn Live sessions for one of our Learn modules. In this case, get started with Power Apps. If you want to find these steps later, you can go right out to aka.ms slash LRN244, and you'll get this page where you can go step by step through that same uh, content we're going to be going over today, or you can find the slides and video later, of course, as well. So our agenda today, we're going to introduce Power Apps, go through some of the building blocks, the related technologies. Power Apps is really, of course, part of the Power Platform. All the different ways you can create a Power App, design your first Power App, and actually get that first Power App created and maybe onto a phone. Of course, this session is live and interactive. There is chat. Make sure you say hi if you have questions. Go ahead and ask them, and we'll be answering them as we go. And then if we have time at the end, we'll answer as many as we can uh, before we run out of time. But with that, let's go ahead and kick it off uh, in April once you introduce Power Apps. Yeah, so to get started, I uh, want to cover a few things. We want to explore what Power Apps is and how it can make your business more efficient. We want to talk about what technologies we can use to perform different tasks in our Power Apps. We're going to learn about different ways that we can build apps in Power Apps and how we can create our first app with Power Apps using an Excel workbook. So diving right in, what exactly is Power Apps? Power Apps is a suite of applications, services, connectors, and a data platform that gives us the opportunity to build applications all with no code. These applications can be desktop, tablet, and mobile applications. And when you say no code, April, what does it mean? You mean actually no code or just a, a lower class of code or what are we talking lower about? class of code so you don't have to learn a traditional programming language like c sharp or javascript to be able to build a power app you can use excel like functions and a point and click interface kind of similar to powerpoint to build an app okay great so what are some of the things that we can do with power apps well, we can use and build apps quickly using the skills that we already have. So kind of like I mentioned, if you're familiar with some of the Office tools already, like PowerPoint, like Excel, and are really familiar with functions and formulas in Excel, you can build a Power App quite easily using those skills. We can connect to cloud services and data sources that you're already using. Thanks to our connector model and the data sources that we offer with the Power Platform, we're able to consume data from all of our Microsoft 365 and dynamic services and other SaaS products all within the Power Platform. We can also share our applications instantly with our coworkers easily so that they can use them either on their phones or tablets or their desktop devices. And that's actually where I wind up using the most is I'm not really on my phone as much, especially now that we're at home all the time, but through the web all the time. It will run in any web browser as well. Yeah, I, I use them quite a bit in, in the uh, web browser also. I'm also a big fan of the mobile device because especially when we're on the go, uh, to being able to have the ability and flexibility to use it on whatever device that you need to. Absolutely. And so what are some of the things just to get your eye, you know, the ideas going in your head here? You know, we can build applications with low code, but what type of applications can we build? Well, really, the possibilities are endless. So think of scenarios like equipment in the field. So that's what's really cool about this. This can be for scenarios for someone in an office or you know, in their home office on their desktop or someone out in the field like a foreman that needs to do an inspection report or equipment inspection to check that in. They can pull this up on their tablets or their phone and create an application and build it and use it all within on their phone. We can be scenarios like employee management. So if you need some kind of check in, check out, some vacation requests, time off requests, solutions, that's a great use case for a power app as well. What about you, Greg? Um, what are some of your favorite use cases? Uh, some of the things I've found where in, in sales, like um, in person in a showroom or something like that, maybe you have a lot of information about your products um, in your systems, maybe an internal website or something like that. And I know as a customer, I, I, it's not my favorite thing to have to follow an employee back to a computer, wherever it is in the showroom, so they can look up something. 
Um, we've seen people create power apps, pull out that same data right there on the device that somebody can carry around, whether it's a tablet or even a phone, and pull out that same information and be able to carry on that conversation and with the customer in front of the thing they were asking about to begin with, which helps the sales, it helps the customer, it helps everybody, and it's been super easy to get started. Definitely. One of the use cases that I love recently is being able to use it to check in and check out of a facility and for uh, contact list checking in. So being able to scan a barcode on your phone, say in another tablet or something that has a power app on it to be able to get into a location. It's a really timely and great use case as well. Definitely. Yeah. So what are some of the building blocks of power apps in general? So there are three main areas that we'll go to to either make or build our applications to use them and to govern them. And uh, Greg's actually going to go a little bit into these building blocks a little bit more here. Thank you, April. Uh, so as April just mentioned, there's a few different building blocks that make Power Apps Power Apps. We're going to go through the real basic steps, sites you might run into, places you might go as you're creating your apps, or you might just read about in documentation so you know, well, what we're talking about when we mention them. First, most obvious, it's the Power Apps homepage at make.powerapps.com. This is the site you're going to probably most often wind up on when you're building your Power Apps. If you're building an app, you're going to start here. This is what I load up all the time, whether I'm creating a new app or even going to find an app to run inside a web browser. Make.powerapps.com is where you want to go. Next up is the Power Apps Studio. It does have its own URL, create.powerapps.com slash studio. This is not a URL that you're really going to type into your browser whole, whole lot. This is a site that's going to pop open when you create a new app from the uh, the Make website. And this is where we actually make our Power Apps. We add our controls, we add, we set our properties, we add the different screens and so on. And um, up here at the very top, right next to the FX here, you see our formula bar. Much like an Excel formula bar, this is where the code runs in a Power App. And it's just a matter a number of different functions that you can then chain together a lot like you do inside Excel. Uh, that language, in case you've um, been wondering, is actually called PowerFX. Um, we actually gave it a name just this morning, so now we have something to call it instead of abstract random language. This is PowerFX. That's that formula language you might be hearing about as we go through, and you're going to be using it inside the Create platform an awful lot. And then, did you have some? No? Okay. Uh, on, and then inside Power Apps Mobile, this is a lot of where you're going to be using your Power Apps. Now, I mentioned earlier, you can run it inside a web browser, but more often than not, the users that you're creating these apps for are going to run them inside inside a phone or a tablet. And there is a Windows app as well. Um, all these are, are available, and they're available in your app store of choice, whether it is um, iOS or Android. Um, you can find the Power Apps app. You download and run that. And then inside that, you find all the power apps that people in your organization have created. And last but not least here, we have the Power Platform Admin Center. This is where if you are an administrator of a particular environment in the Power Platform, you can configure those settings, add people to an environment, um, update things as you need to, so reset environments you have to. A lot of the kind of administratively uh, tasks that are really in there. Sometimes this is going to be entirely managed by your IT organization, and that's okay. They're used to managing this sort of stuff. Sometimes I might pass on administrative tasks for some of those environments to people outside the IT in the organization that um, are, are closer to the people actually inside that environment using it. Now, what do I mean when I, I keep mentioning an environment? It's a way that the Power Platform has to separate out uh, sets of app applications, data, uh, workflows all together into a particular group. And these environments can have different users, they can have different security policies, they can have different uh, permissions on them. And it's a way to say, keep your budget apps separate from all the rest of the apps that uh, your employees are using to make sure that data doesn't get out to people that, doesn't, that don't need it, for example. All that is managed right here inside the admin center. And you can't really talk about administration with a Microsoft uh, product if you don't talk about licensing. Now, most folks that uh, come in to use Power Apps or Power Automate use uh, a license that comes with their Microsoft 365 plan. So if you have Microsoft 365, 
you're using Office, you're using Teams, you're using email, and it all comes through um, one login, then you can you, you get Power Apps and Power Automate to use against that, that Microsoft 365 information, whether it's an Excel sheet or sitting in uh, SharePoint or Microsoft Excel to create apps based on that information. Now you might have a Power Apps license based on your Dynamics license. If you're using Dynamics, you're already using Power Apps in a way, um, and you're definitely using the underlying dataverse that comes with it. And so if you have a Dynamics license, you are good to go. You have a Power Apps license to do everything you need to do inside that environment. And is that, uh, Greg, what some people might have heard called as a seeded license and some of like the licensing documentation? Is that the same thing? Yeah, that is that is the same thing that um, if you have a license that they might, you might see called a seated license, that's what they're talking about, where if you've already got a seat for one, one of these other licenses has got you covered. Um, that's what they're talking about. But you might also see standalone licenses mentioned uh, mentioned documentation and elsewhere. And what they're talking about is an, a license for Power Apps, Power Automate, and one of the other Power Platform, Power Platform licenses themselves. And they come in two flavors. It, it, you, know, you might see it as called a premium license or a standalone license. And you can license things either per user or per app. Um, those are two main ways you do it. And I'll dig into that just a little bit. But if you have one of these licenses, then you have, have access to everything that the Power Platform can do, whether you're getting your data from Microsoft 365 or the hundreds of other available data source connectors. If you want to uh, connect to custom data sources that maybe we don't have a connector for yet, if you want to do some other things that are available inside the Power Platform, you do need a, a premium or standalone license. And uh, let's dig into what that looks like a little bit here. So per app licensing allows you to license the app that you're creating yourself. And that app isn't just the one, maybe one Power App. That can be up to two applications and one Power Apps portal for a, very, for a specific business scenario. So maybe you have a portal that people can log into your customers to check on maybe the trouble tickets. And maybe you have two different apps for the same situation, or maybe you have an app for your customer service folks and then a different app for your sales folks both talking to that those same customers, both talking that same information around the same scenario, just different apps for different uh, audiences. That can be covered under this per app license. Uh, that is best if you have a bunch of users using a single app and maybe not uh, nearly as many using the rest of your apps. Maybe you want to license that particular app separately. Now on the other side, there is a per, per user license where you're licensing the users using the Power Apps and not the apps themselves. So this basically grants a, a particular user to use and create as many Power Apps as they want to um, inside the organization um, within organization governance guidelines, all that, of course. Uh, but they won't be li limited by the license at all for what they're using. So this can be a lot more flexible for your, for your organization that if you want to turn on Power Apps for everybody, you want to see what the organization can do with, with, with Power Apps, maybe you can license it per user and not make your users need to worry about that and just have everything be covered. That's an option for you as well. Now, licensing always has a million questions and other thoughts people might have, especially when you start talking to the people that wind up paying for these licenses. And there's a few uh, useful resources here as well. You can go to powerapps.microsoft.com slash pricing, us.flow.microsoft.com slash pricing, or powerapps.microsoft.com slash portals for the pricing there as well. The portals, Pricing, the licensing is a little bit different. It's more based around usage uh, than per user necessarily, but to make sure to take a look at that website to dig into uh, just a little more about the, the licensing and what, what you might be running into. Now, before we get any further, this is a learn module, so we need to do our first knowledge check. So in your chat, make sure you go ahead and answer the questions that are there and, and kind of throw in your answer. But question number one for our session today, where do you configure and customize your app? Is it A, in the Power Apps mobile, um, right there inside your, your, your tablet? Um, is it in the Power Apps admin center? You configure and customize things there. Um, is it inside Microsoft Dynamics 365? Could you customize your apps in there? Don't, don't not feeling like it's it's any of those so far. I don't know about you. Yeah, I'm not I'm not 
feeling really all those, and, you know, the admin center may be dynamics, maybe, but dynamics apps are kind of their own thing. And then last but not least, we have inside the Power App Studio, which the word studio just kind of in general might give it away. That is, in fact, our answer. All right, so before we can move on, we've got a couple couple questions here in the chat. Um, from Jennifer, we have a question. Are Power Apps just for internal users, not public? Um, that is generally the case. Now, Power Apps portals can be, can be uh, for public use, but Power Apps themselves do require somebody in your organization uh, to use them. So you do log in through Microsoft 365 uh, and uh, to even get into the app itself. And so they are for inside your organization um, to do all the different things that they can do inside your org. So that is for just uh, Power Apps folks. Um, I am seeing that by and large, most folks did say Power App Studio on this one, so that's great. And one more question, is there a reason someone would use a desktop copy of Power Apps to build workflows for a SharePoint online site? So there's a few different things going on here. So you can inside the, uh, there's a Power Apps app that you can run for Windows right now, although we're working on a brand new version of that uh, coming down the road. Um, but we just talked about and a big announcement today that Power Automate Desktop was going to be included inside your Windows license uh, to download and start building workflows right there inside the Windows app. Now, Power Automate and Power Automate Desktop are there are separate from what we're talking about right now as far as as far as licensing and how you create these things. If you're creating a Power App, you definitely are going to be doing it inside the web experience inside the Power App Studio at create.powerapps.com. Um, if you're creating Power Automate workflows, there is a, a web editor for that as well. And then inside Power Automate Desktop, you can start creating flows there also. But that is separate from what we're going to be digging into today. But Power Automate is another part of the Power Platform. It's our workflow engine for the Power Platform. And it has uh, that desktop application to yeah, do a lot more than you can do just inside the website. And That's I was really Power excited about that announcement. Deal. And we'll be talking about Power Automate here and a little bit more and how we can use that together with Power Apps for our business solutions. And speaking of Power Automate, why don't we just jump right into our related technologies? April, what do you think? Great, yes. So uh, as far as Power Apps, you know, we know we can use that to build applications, but typically when we're talking about solving a problem or building a business solution, it's not just an app. There's usually some other things involved. We need to maybe pull data from other data sources. Maybe we need a workflow process as part of that for an approval. So that's where these other related technologies really come into play. So one of the big things is data sources. So we briefly mentioned this in the beginning here, but with the Power Platform, we have the ability with data sources and these things called connectors to bring cloud and even on-premise data into our Power Apps. So we can access that through these built-in connectors or even something called custom connectors. So we have, um, I think, over 400 different connectors to various SaaS products, whether that's things like SharePoint and Dynamics or other products like Salesforce and Twitter. Um, but if you need to build something that connects to something that's not in one of our 400 different connectors right now, we can build what's called a custom connector so that we can connect to any of the RESTful APIs that you might want to access. And we even have that gateway. So what that means is if there's some kind of data that we need to connect to behind the firewall on an on-premise server, like SQL or SharePoint on-prem, whatever it might be, we can install this gateway and use that to connect to that data into our Power Apps applications. We also have something called Microsoft Dataverse. So this is our compliant and scalable data service that's fully integrated into Power Apps and the entire Power Platform. So that's a good solution and database um, that we'll talk a little bit more about later on here. And then we have Power Automate. We were just talking about this. So if we need some kind of workflow solution, maybe we need an approval, maybe we want to receive some notifications, send an email, uh, run a process, go pull data from somewhere else, whatever it might be, we can leverage Power Automate in tandem with Power Apps to build that holistic end-to-end -end business solution. I know for myself, I use Power Automate more than not to send out those approvals. So we where if anyone wants to save some data, maybe it needs a manager okay before that data gets uh, pushed out somewhere. 
Power Automate is really great for stuff like that, and we can run those workflows straight from our Power Apps if we need to. Exactly, I love, big fan of Power Automate here, especially when used with our Power Apps. All right, so a little bit more about those data sources and those connectors. So in Power Apps and our Canvas applications, most of the time you're going to want to pull external data from somewhere. So whether that is SharePoint or the common data or Dataverse, so it says common data service on there, so that's something I wanted to bring up here. Um, if you see that, that's actually what Dataverse is now. That was the old name for Dataverse, so it was recently renamed there. Um, uh, but also pulling information from things like Dropbox and uh, OneDrive, so we can just leverage the connector and pull and consume the data. And depending on the connector, we can either write to it. They, each connector has different actions and things that it can do. So we might be able to read data from it or maybe even write and store data in some of these different connectors. And uh, April, do IT folks have a way to control which of these connectors people can use in their apps? Yes, great question. And this is something that if you did catch some of the other sessions today at Ignite, that they have continuous more improvements on this. So we have something called DLP policies that we can set up in that Power Platform Admin Center that Greg was just talking about. So we can do things like restrict people from being able to, say, use the Twitter connector in tandem with the SharePoint connector, or even down to the level now, what they announced in some of the earlier sessions here, of being able to control what actions in a con certain connector you can do. So we have complete control over this in the Power Platform Admin Center to be able to determine what we can do and who can use and consume some of these connectors. And just to add to what April said, if you see things referring to DLPs or DLP policies, those are data loss policies. Those are basically the limits around what connectors can do so that IT folks can feel better about having um, folks all across the environment or organization creating these apps. Yeah, thanks to, for clarifying that. So data loss prevention, meaning uh, avoiding leaking data that might be personal that you don't want to get out there, you know, maybe in the Twitter scenario, not leaking social security numbers out there, just you know, restricting that in some way. That's what those data loss prevention policies do. So a little bit more on the on-premise data side of things. So if you do have data that's not stored in the cloud, it is stored somewhere uh, on premises, we have this gateway. So it sets what's going to happen is you can install this on an on premise computer and that can communicate with Power Apps and the Power Platform. Now, the cool thing about this is, too, is you set this gateway up somewhere on one of your on premise computers and you can use that gateway both in Power Apps and Power Automate to pull data from whatever service that is that you're connecting to with the gateway. So it really opens up the possibilities of the type of data and services that we can connect to. Now, Dataverse. Now, I mentioned this. This was formerly known as that common data service you saw there. This is the Power Platform's data service and database that lets you store and manage your data for all of the different Power Platform applications, whether it be Power Apps, Power Automates, or virtual agents. Now, with Dataverse, uh, there's lots of different reasons that we might want to use this, say, over other databases like SharePoint. So for one, we get standard and custom tables within Dataverse so that we can have a rich storage option that's relational, meaning we can have rich data types in that, simple to manage. So you don't have to be a database administrator and know a lot about queries in a SQL Server to be able to manage this. It's a really simple, easy to use interface to manage, and it's securable, and it's able to, we can even have permissions restrict, see who can see you know, certain data in there, um, down to what columns and rows of data that certain individuals can see. And we also, and not a benefit of this, we can easily access our dynamics data. So if you are wanting to build, say, an application that does consume some information from dynamics, we're able to store that data in this Dataverse database so that we can easily access it. That's, April, that's one thing that I've found why you would use Dataverse as opposed to something like SharePoint when somebody's asking why, why maybe you would want to put your data there when you've had SharePoint for such a long time. And one thing I always point at that SharePoint um, people always ask for is when I was living that SharePoint life was the ability to have different security on particular fields in, in your table. So 
maybe people can have access to all the data in a table except one field. Maybe it's a social security number or some sort of employee ID field um, where you want to lock that down only certain people. The Dataverse can do that. And it can do it pretty easily and without needing uh, a PhD in, in data sources to figure out how to do it as well, which is really great. Exactly. Yeah, I, I come from a SharePoint background myself, and that was um, usually one of the big reasons why you would transition off of, say, using SharePoint and, and into Dataverse was for that, that reason alone, being able to open up the doors and have more flexible security options. All right, so you know what what else can we do here? So I mentioned rich metadata. So you know, going along with the SharePoint scenario, uh, if we needed to build, say, a application that allows us to upload pictures, so maybe we want to take a picture out on a job site of something and have that being stored in our app. If you're using something like SharePoint, that's a little bit difficult to do um, with SharePoint as a database. You have usually there's some kind of flow involved to help you upload that image to the right location. That's something that Dataverse can easily handle because it has built in image fields um, that allow that to be much easier. So that's that rich metadata that we can get with Dataverse. Also logic and validation. So we mentioned, you know, locking down certain columns or fields of data, also restricting maybe what can go in it, right? Or maybe enforcing a field needing to be required if another field equals this. Those kind of logic and validation rules are easy to apply in Dataverse as well. And one, one of the other things that I really love about Dataverse is really honestly Dataverse for teams. Um, if you are in one of the organizations that has allowed you to create Power Apps right, so right there inside Microsoft Teams, the environment those run in is called Dataverse for Teams. And what it allows you to do is, again, right inside Teams, start creating the, the tables and all the column definitions um, and maybe even start entering the data that your app needs inside Teams without ever having to go to another site, without ever having to leave where you are. And that's something you can only really get with, with Dataverse running inside Teams. Yes, uh, and if you haven't checked out uh, data virtual teams, definitely encourage you to look that up. It just gives us a, a great way to build teams based applications, leveraging power apps and Dataverse. They're really powerful. So, you know, speaking of data virtual teams, what that kind of is comprised of a bunch of the different power platform technologies. So uh, with the Power Platform, we're looking at four main things. So today we're talking about Power Apps for the application development side of things, but we also can take advantage of Power BI if we need to do things like dashboards and reporting and analytics. We have Power Automate, which we briefly touched on for workflow automation. Now this can be automation for cloud services, you know, connecting to Power Apps and SharePoint and things like that, but can also be for that uh, robotic process automation that we talked about with the Power Automate desktop. So automating things that don't have a cloud endpoint or somewhere that we can easily get to. Maybe it's copying things from one Excel spreadsheet to another, things like that. That's something that we can do with that robotic process automation that uh, Power Automate Desktop offers. And then we have Power Virtual Agents. And when we talk about that Dataverse for Teams that Greg brought up, this is a great use case for Power Virtual Agents because we can easily build chatbots that we can integrate into things like Teams with no to low code. So we don't have to go out to something like Azure bot service and, and know the ins and outs of that. And we just have kind of like a point and click editor where we can create chatbots and virtual agents. So diving into uh, this a little bit deeper, let's, let's talk about Power Automate some more because that is a great integration point with Power Apps like we kind of talked about. So any traditional workflow that you might want to automate, it's a great use case for Power Automate. So it's going to allow you to bring in things like our you know, robotic process automation, automate legacy systems. So whether it is like someone mentioned earlier, taking a SharePoint designer workflow and automating that and replacing it with Power Automate, we can do that um, all with this one tool. And an example um, that we'll see here of how that can kind of work um, of the Power Automate logic. Um, so if some things that we can do um, if we go there um, to that slide, we can check and see, you know, get an item from a SharePoint list. So we can have these things called triggers. So what kicks off this workflow? And then we can have these things called actions. What do we want to happen after an event happens? 
So after maybe um, you know something is added into a SharePoint list, maybe we want to send an email for approval, or maybe we want to create another item um, in a list. We can send emails and meeting requests and add files to OneDrive. Really, the possibilities are endless with all of those connectors that we have at our disposal. So April, somebody actually asked a question in the chat of what a typical example of a process might be that you can integrate or automate with uh, Outlook 365. So we have one example here, just sending an email uh, from a workflow. Um, but what do you have any any favorites around like maybe Outlook data that you've seen? Uh, yeah, so one of the ones that I love is when an email is received. So that's a trigger that we can have. So say you want to prioritize or get an instant alert on your phone anytime you get an email from your boss because you want to make sure that you don't miss it. We actually have these things in Power Automate called templates. So there's a template for that where we can say, send me an alert anytime that I receive an email from my manager or my boss. Uh, so that's a great example of some of the integrations that we can do with the Outlook connector and one that I actually use quite a bit. What about you, Greg? Uh, that, that's that's one of my favorite ones as well. Um, the other one I, I've seen is when uh, I have a power app that somebody can uh, use to create like a request to present a topic um, internally inside of one of a set of meetings we have. And as soon as we have one of those meetings approved, then it reaches out to that the shared calendar that the meetings have, grabs the calendar invite, uh, replaces the content with like the speaker name and what they're going to be talking about, and then sends that update out to everybody. So that enables uh, somebody to approve that somebody's going to present and have somebody present and just have that calendar invite just show up for everybody without having to have a single person send that out and manage all those invites. It's all managed by the app, which has been really helpful um, in that sort of process. Awesome. Sounds like a great use case. We do have one more question before we go forward. Somebody okay. is asking if workflow approval data is stored inside Dataverse. Uh, yes, so it, it actually is. So um, there's some tables there in Dataverse that stores that information that's kept there. Um, but the cool thing too about uh, Power Automate in particular, you know, when approvals, we have the ability to put that data, you know, or kind of build our own um, logging per se of, you know, when something happens. So like if something is approved and you needed that to go somewhere else, maybe you have a special ticketing system that you use and we have a connector for it. Um, you can build that in into your flow as well. So yes, it, it is there in Dataverse, but you do have the ability to move that and, and somewhere else if you need to. And one more question. Uh, lots of lots of questions about Dataverse, which is great, by the way, folks. Um, would lists and they've capitalized lists, so I'm assuming they mean SharePoint lists, be a, a, a simple or Microsoft lists, I suppose, whatever right. it's called. Um, would lists be a simple version of Dataverse for storing info? Um, you know, it, it, it's different. So, you know, Microsoft List, first of all, and SharePoint List are actually the same thing. Um, so just get, getting that out there. Um, yeah, I mean, in a way, I mean, it, it, it could be a good place to store data if you don't have a ton of data and if you don't need to do things like we mentioned earlier, like have really strict security on different things. Um, that is, you know, a, a place that you can store the data. Um, there just might be scenarios where, you know, if your requirements like the security things we talked about or you're storing a lot of data and need a lots of logic and validation where Dataverse uh, might be a better fit. But yes, uh, that Microsoft list are definitely a, a place that you can store data with your power apps. Yep, I, there, there is a connector for that, of course. Um, I, I think of it as somewhere in between uh, Dataverse, where you might put a lot of data and put a lot of um, uh, users or a lot of load into, and then um, somewhere between that and maybe Microsoft Excel, which is um, very straightforward and, and very um, not really meant for a ton of data updates, but maybe more reading uh, than, than writing updates back. Then you have uh, Microsoft lists in the middle to kind of fill that gap if if uh, it meets your needs at that level. Yep, I would agree. It's a good kind of step up there of the different data sources. All right, um, so talking a little bit more about the other integrations, Power BI, this is an important one to, to go over. So any scenario where you need some kind of analytics within your business solution or process that you're building, that is a great fit for Power BI. So um, it allows business users to use a number of different charts and graphs. So you can have things like maps in there. Um, you can have uh, linear charts, bar charts, you know, uh, 
whatever you need, that Power BI usually has some kind of visualization for it and even comprehensive reports and dashboards. So how does that work in tandem with Power Apps then? So there's a few things that we can do. One, we have the ability to embed a Power BI tile into our Power Apps applications. And I use this one quite a bit. I love this integration. So we can have a Power Apps Canvas app. We can put the Power BI tile component or widget there in our Power App and see a particular visualization in the context of our app. Um, other ways that we can do this, though, we can do it the opposite way. If you have a Power BI dashboard and you want to embed a Power App Canvas app into that, you can do that as well. And I know, I think, uh, Greg, you've told me before that you use this one quite a bit, this integration. Yeah, this one's been my favorite uh, lately, really, because it might not be clear from this uh, screenshot, but like this, this rectangle here, the product details, that's actually a Power App running inside the report. But if you've got uh, folks that are using a lot of Power BI, and chances are people that have not using a lot of Power BI. Um, but. Uh, inside Power BI, um, as you're clicking around, maybe you click on one of the data pieces inside the graph, it'll narrow down, filter that data, and then the Power App itself gets a filtered view of that data, same as anything else inside Power BI. So it can be super powerful to build an app that lets somebody make a change or somehow otherwise react to the data they're seeing in the report without ever having to leave that report, um, just making it easier for your users to do their thing. Yeah, anything we can do to reduce clicks and people having to go out to different applications to, to see data is great. And this is a great integration that we can have with Power Apps and Power BI in there. All right, so on to talking a little bit more about Power Apps and Power Automate. So there might be a case where you need to decide what tool to use for what functionality you're trying to accomplish. So take the concept of maybe you have an application and you need to send an email. Now, this is actually something that both Power Apps and Power Automate can handle. So how do you decide and make that decision of which one to do that in? So a few different things that you need to think through and consider when you're choosing which tool to use. Um, for Power Apps from that side of things, if it's a simple email notification and you don't need a lot of uh, customization in the body of the message, then uh, Power Apps is a good solution for that. Now, the minute though um, you need to uh, the minute though that you need to have more um, styling in that, uh, with Power Apps to do that, you would have to inject HTML. So uh, that uh, is something where maybe Power Automate would be a better solution. Um, so going on to, so Power Automate, we can do the same thing. We can send emails, but the beauty of that is we have more customization over it, so we can easily still uh, customize and um, control what shows up there um, without having to write any HTML and have way more control over that. Um, you don't have a report and you want to still try to show the sort of information inside a Power App, you can just add uh, graphs and charts directly into the Power App itself. Uh, Power Apps has a graph control. This is an example of what it looks like here. So if you don't have a full report and you just want to show some of the data that you're pulling through and in a graph, which happens a lot inside applications, um, you can do that directly inside Power Apps as well if, if you're looking for something like that. Yes. Um, and also, um, so, you know, Power BI as well for, um, you know, you can build that and, and have that into your application. Uh, with Power Apps, which is great also. Okay, okay. Um, so I think, uh, Greg, do we have our first uh, knowledge check for this yes, sure. section here? Yeah, okay. So question number two, uh, and make sure that you're, you're looking at the chat there and putting your answers there. Uh, which of these statements is true about data sources? Is it A, in Power Apps, app data comes primarily from your local device? Um, is it B, Power Apps is not able to connect to external data, 
all data must be stored in the Power Apps application. Um, don't think that's right. I think we talked about uh, being able to connect to a bunch of different data sources. Or is it C, Power Apps uses connectors to connect to data sources. If the data source supports it, Power Apps can read and write to the data source. Oh, that one's a little tricky. Um, so for this one, like, I don't know, A calls out to me a little bit because the app data can come from your local device. You can get things like the user's current location or take pictures with the camera, and that definitely comes from your, your tablet or your phone. Um, B, I think, is definitely out. Um, but I think I'm feeling C. What do you think, April? Yeah, C feels right. I know uh, I remember talking about connect uh, connectors there and being able to, to uh, depending on what connector you use, you could read or write to that. So that, that's sounding right to me. And well, let's see what... Uh, um, what everyone else thought here. Looks like yep. it was the right answer. And it looks like that's what we're getting uh, by large. By and large, yep. a couple folks for A makes sense, um, but definitely the answer is C. All right, yeah, great job, everyone. Cool. And uh, Greg, you're going to talk a little bit more about ways to build Power Apps now. Yep, absolutely. So building Power Apps is one of, one of those things that it takes a little bit to get started. It takes a little bit of figuring out how the formulas work and how the controls will get added and arranged on uh, in an app. And we'll take all a look at all that in the demo in a little while. But when we're talking about building Power Apps, there's really three main ways you get started. You can create an app from a, a template or a sample. And on, site, on the uh, make.powerapps.com site, we do have a bunch of template apps that are apps that are I don't want to say ready to go, but maybe are 80 to 90 percent of the way there for apps that we've heard from people that they create pretty often, whether it's a to do app or an app to help uh, do some budget tracking or uh, one of my favorites to um, to manage a meeting as far as who's attending the notes you need to take any takeaways and action items from it can be controlled inside that power app as well. And then you just hit a button and it sends out a bunch of notes and tasks everybody in the meeting. That's all inside the templates. Um, you can create an, a Canvas app just from blank. You can get that one blank screen and then you can go nuts. You can create whatever you want. That can be a little intimidating at first, but once you get familiar with everything, you're going to find yourself probably creating from blank more often than not. And last but not least, you can create a data source and create a, a power app from there. So um, maybe you can look at pointing to a piece of data inside a uh, inside Dataverse or inside SharePoint, or in our demo later, we're going to talk about actually just pointing at an Excel sheet. And with that data, um, Power Apps will generate an app for you to get you started. And when we talk about no code, that's what we're talking about, where Power Apps will do so much for you that you just need to maybe write a little bit of that low code uh, to get you the rest of the way. But first off, that template. So the templates are going to be, and we're looking at the budget tracker right here that I mentioned, uh, they use sample data that you know, either just lives inside the app itself or maybe points to an Excel sheet that we'll then uh, put somewhere in your in your OneDrive uh, to determine what's possible and and help you understand what Power Apps is about, what you can build, how things are put together. Um, this is actually a good example right here in the screenshot of what just a simple graph control looks like. Um, in this case, pie graph um, split three ways. Uh, but that that's from a template where you take something that's there, maybe you apply your colors, maybe you change a few labels, or maybe you add a little bit more, and then you send it out to your user ready to go. Next, we have from a, uh, from a data source. When you go to create a new app, you can choose any of the data the sources listed here, and you're not limited to just these five. And of course, you're going to see a lot of the Microsoft stuff, and then if you want to create data from Salesforce, you can do that as well. These are all just examples of our data connectors that can get you data. If you click on this arrow here at the end, that'll then bring you to the full list of connectors that are available in your environment to pull data from wherever it might be. So if you want to start with data and not just these five, make sure you click on that arrow. But I mentioned SharePoint, we should talk to that as well. If you want to create an app based on data that is inside the SharePoint list, either data that's already there, or maybe you've got a blank list you want to start putting data into, you can do that right inside SharePoint. You just click that Power Apps drop down there at the top, uh, click Create an App or Customize Forms, and it'll uh, bring up Power Apps 
connect the Power App Studio experience directly to your SharePoint data already, set up that connection for you, and then give you an app that'll be uh, good enough to get you started for uh, dealing with that SharePoint data. And then you can add whatever other functionality you want to as well on top of that. And then last, as I mentioned earlier, a blank canvas. It is a blank canvas. Um, and you can you can make power apps that do just very simple things, or you can make power apps that don't even look like a power app. And somebody would never know um, if they didn't have to run the power apps app to get to it. Uh, and it, it's it's entirely up to you. So you can you can go crazy, or you can start from template, or you can start from SharePoint, or any other data source in that matter. There's so many different ways to create these power apps, and you can tell I'm I'm excited about it because I mean, well, it's one of my favorite things to do these days, and it's not just because it's my job. Maybe a little bit, um, but um, we'll get into next. Definitely when you're talking about building power app, you want to design that power app. You don't want to dive headfirst in right away necessarily, but you want to maybe give a little thought about what you're doing first. But before we do that, there is a question in the chat um, how, uh, from Mark. How do the connectors or power apps deal with API calls? Um, April, do you want to take that one? Um, yeah, well, I was going to ask you if you did since I got the last couple of questions. Oh, yeah, sure. There. Yeah, no, okay. Uh, I'll do my part. <laughs> no, no. So, the, so the connectors of Power Apps are actually making API calls on the back end. Um, if you use uh, something like a uh, browser dev tools, um, or there act, there's actually built in uh, tools called the Power Apps monitor to see those connections going back and forth, what you would see is a connection from the Power App going out to an, uh, an Azure API managed uh, API that's part of the product itself. And that server turns around and, and calls the connectors API, whether it's Dataverse, whether it's SharePoint, whether it's Salesforce, whatever it is. So the APIs are kind of like a layer underneath those connectors actually doing kind of the low level data calls. And connectors are just a way to um, make it easier for, for folks that haven't been doing web dev forever. Uh, to understand, to get that data and and, and um, do stuff with it. And one more question from Terry: uh, Can Power Apps use an existing Power BI gateway, or does Power Apps need its own gateway? Um, now Power Apps, I, I I want knowing what I know about Power BI, and I don't know this one off the top of my head, so I apologize for that. Um, the Power BI gateways and the gateways we're talking about inside the Power Platform, I think, are not quite the same thing. Um, April, correct me if I'm wrong. Yeah, so I, I'm not 100% sure either, but I believe the gateway works in Power Apps and Power Automate, but I think Power BI is a bit different. Um, so I, I don't think it's the exact same as the same gateway that you would use in, say, Power Apps and Power Automate. And that is something that we uh, in the product team have been looking at trying as we go forward. Um, if you see um, folks that are running the product or um, managing the product talking about one one power platform and kind of getting things to feel like one platform, that's what we're talking about. You might see some of these overlapping terms that aren't quite the same thing. That's because we've had you know things like Power BI that have actually been around for a lot longer than the rest of the power platform. And the rest of the apps that have kind of come along separately, whether it's Power Apps, Power Automate, Power Virtual Agents, they're all kind of different ages. And so we're trying to get them into one uh, one kind of lockstep platform is taking a little uh, a little time, but we're getting there. And when we can look at this sort of thing, these sort of things getting easier down the road as time goes on. Absolutely. Okay. Well, I think that uh, that's all the questions there. So, so far we've talked about what Power Apps is, some of the integration points. We've talked about the ways that we can build Power Apps, whether it's from template, from a data source, from blank. So now let's get into the designing process. How do we go about actually designing a Power App? So there are a few different things that we need to address when it comes to building a solution in Power Apps. We need to make sure we understand the business requirements, the data model, the user experience, the user interface, business logic, and output. And we'll go into each one of these here. Um, so starting with um, the business requirements, and um, well, let's, again, let's switch to the next one here, and we'll talk about how we can go from building a blank canvas app. So as Greg mentioned before, we have that option to start from blank, and it's literally a blank canvas, which can be a little bit overwhelming. So how do you go from something like that with nothing on it to something like what we're seeing here, a fully baked 
customizable solution with you know service deck, desk tickets here. We can create new ones. We can see a dashboard and all of that. So where do we start? First thing that we have to do for any solution that we're building, whether it's Power Apps or any other tool we're using, is we need to understand the needs of our users. So one of the first things that we need to do, though, is we want to challenge the existing process because it can be tempting to just take, say, the paper form, maybe if that's what you're replacing uh, for an inspection and just replicating that uh, in Power Apps because you could probably do it and it's possible. But the question is, should you? Um, this is your opportunity to really take that process and potentially make it better. So the way that we can do that is we can question what the actual business needs are of the users and find ways that we can make the process more efficient. Um, my favorite version of that, April, is the forms that you fill out that so many times will inevitably have that part just maybe in bold, maybe at the bottom says, this isn't for you. Don't actually fill this part out. Right. Um, you don't, like if you're building a Power App, maybe you only include that top part and then have an approval process or a submission process where then whoever in that next tier, whether it's somebody taking in the information or management or whoever is supposed to fill in that part that says don't fill this in, um, then fills in those those fields either in their own app or maybe a part of the app that you've created that only they can access. So that's an idea of forms into an app is a great way to get started and see where those opportunities are, but we can do better than just the form once we actually get it inside a inside a screen, of course. Exactly. Or, you know, another great one, um, check this if and then if this applies, fill out these next 10 questions, right? A great use case there to uh, improve that process by showing or hiding and only requiring that information if you check that checkbox or whatever it might be. So, um, you know, how do we, so we understand the needs, how do we get the business requirements? Because that's the next big step here. Every application you develop is going to have its own unique set of business requirements that we need to build the solution. So things that we might consider here in this aspect, uh, what security and privacy and compliance requirements do we have to follow? We touched on this a bit earlier with Dataverse and the ability to you know, restrict fields, maybe social security numbers. That's a great one. That's some personal identifiable information that we might want to restrict and need to make sure we're being really cognizant of to secure. So if that's a requirement, we need to know about it from the get go. What about any you know, regulations or authentication authorization requirements? Someone asked earlier, you know, is, is Power Apps just for internal users typically? So what are those requirements? Who will need to authenticate and use this application? Is it internal users in our you know, company or is it external users? That could be a, you know, a use case for uh, Power Apps portals, like Greg mentioned earlier. So identifying those things from the start um, is going to help you make sure that you plan out the best solution for that. Um, and then also the last note that we want to you know, place here, you don't have to know all the answers and have this great you know, big process of every possible thing that you might need mapped out. You just need to know the basic requirements. Um, okay, so the next thing is, is offline mode. Now this um, is something that you want to consider. So Power Apps does offer the ability for us to interact and build in the capability to interact with our applications in an offline scenario. So think when you have airplane mode turned on on your phone or you're out in the middle of nowhere and you have no internet signal, right? Uh, we can do that, but you want to make sure that you are identifying that need if you can from the beginning, just because it might make it a little bit easier to plan with that in mind um, that you might need that rather than going in after the fact. Not to say that you can't uh, build a solution and go in after the fact and add an offline capability. You definitely can. So, but just something to consider if that's going to be a requirement because it is a little bit of extra work to add in. And one thing I'll just add to that too is that for, for right now anyway, offline mode, offline capability to to load and, and, and save data to be synchronized later is something that only really works in a power app that runs on your phone or on a tablet right now. Um, it doesn't work if you're running a, a power app inside a web browser, and it doesn't work if you're running it inside the current Windows, uh, Windows app. Uh, that's something that they're gonna be bringing to the Windows app soon. So if you're using a Windows tablet, things like that, something to think about as, uh, as you're uh, planning out your app. Yep. All right, so data model. This is the next big decision. Once you have your business requirements, you need to figure out 
where you're actually going to store your data and what data you need to interact with. So one of the cool things about Power Apps being we can actually mix and match and have data from various different sources, uh, data sources in one single application. So, you know, first identifying what data sources do I need to connect to? Maybe it's SharePoint or Dynamics or an Excel, you know, sheet on a OneDrive, whatever it might be, identifying where the data is and how you need to consume it in your application. Um, also, you know, what, be mindful of maybe where your users are day to day. If they are in SharePoint right now and already interacting with the SharePoint list to store some information about, you know, budget requests or whatever it might be, um, you know, we can integrate that in with the SharePoint connector uh, within our applications here. And it doesn't have to be just one data source. We can mix and match. And as we mentioned earlier, Dataverse might be a great use case for that as well. Um, you know, if you're starting scratch from scratch and uh, just want a, a secure and easy to manage place to store your data. Um, and make sure that you're considering too, because we kind of we briefly touched on the licensing aspect of things earlier. Um, so make sure when you're fleshing all this out that you are considering the licensing costs, you know, with Dataverse um, being, having to have that additional licensing there. Um, so just make sure that you kind of think all of that through um, from the data model perspective. And that's actually something that you brought up a great point, April. If your users are used to going to SharePoint, maybe SharePoint is also your internet and they get a lot of information from there. You could always embed your Power Apps onto a SharePoint page, whether or not it's actually talking to SharePoint data. Now, if it is talking to SharePoint data, great. If it needs to pull from Dataverse or if it wants to pull from Dataverse and SharePoint and Twitter, for example, you can do that as well. So, but you do need to figure out um, what the best case is for your particular app and, and more importantly, your, your users. Yeah, or, or maybe your users are in Teams. And so that could be a great use case for the Dataverse for Teams or embedding your, your Power App in Teams. So just some Absolutely. things to consider um, from that end. You know, so next, once you have your, your data model and your business requirements and all that figured out, now you need to really start honing in and thinking about the user experience. So with Canvas apps giving us that complete control um, over the user experience, um, it can be a little bit overwhelming. You know, like, how do I know what to put on here and how to, how to um, really build this out? So one of the main points I want to make here is just because you can doesn't necessarily mean you should. It can't be tempting to put everything you could possibly need in one application. Um, I really like the philosophy of keeping it simple, as simple as possible. You want to make sure that people coming into the application that you built for the first time, it makes sense for them, it's intuitive, and they don't really need to go read a long documentation to figure out how to use the app, right? Just making sure that it's really simple to follow and intuitive. Um, other things to consider from, you know, design um, side of things, you want to you typically make sure that your applications kind of match your cu customer branding. So maybe your company colors and logos. Uh, another cool thing we can do is maybe pop ups um, and showing your hiding buttons. You know, Greg mentioned you might have sections of a form if you're replicating one where it only applies to this group of people. We can share or hide that using some conditions easily. Um, you know, so an example of what the, a good UX would look like um, here, um, we look at a survey one if we go uh, to, to the next slide there. So we have a class survey, we can have a rating control with stars rating the survey, and when we click submit, if we go to the next screen, this shows a great element, a design element here of a pop up. So one of the easiest things we can do from a user experience side of things is making sure we're always communicating to our users. So we gave a quick message that, hey, your survey was submitted successfully, great job, and they have the option to close out the form. So that goes a lot, a uh, long way from user experience side of things. And, uh, and then user interface. So you know, when you're trying to figure out how to build out your application, uh, there are a few tools that we can use to kind of create what we call a mock-up or just a kind of a sketch of how we want to interact with the app and how it should be laid out. So two tools that you can use are either Visio or Power Apps. So a lot of us have Visio and use that, um, you know, for, you know, processing, uh, process mapping and all of that. So that's definitely an option. Um, the one that I kind of like, though, I don't know about you, Greg, is I'm kind of parceled to just mocking it up in Power Apps because it is so simple to drag your controls in there. You can really just create the layout of how you want everything to be in Power Apps itself and then come in um, after the fact and kind of add in the, the data in that logic that we talked about. Yeah, that is actually my favorite thing is do it inside, inside Power Apps because it, like you just mentioned, it's so easy to do that. 
but I've seen folks do it inside PowerPoint or even just on pen and you know pencil and paper. Um, all of these are totally valid ways to go. Definitely, Visio and Power Apps is not the the only way to go. But let's let's take a look at Visio. Yeah, I mean, so I mean, Visio is a great tool for creating these kind of mockups. You know, being able to have a wireframe like like you see here, um, easily visualize what the screen could look like. Um, so, a great way to do that, and it's kind of an example of what that could look like. Um, you know, but the same thing, um, you know, mockup we could do in Power Apps just uh, just as easily as you're seeing here. So we can have our controls laid out. And again, the benefit of doing it this way is um, you're not duplicating any effort. You're not creating the mockup in Visio and then having to go do that in the Power App. You can do it in one spot and uh, not duplicate as much effort. So just something to consider there. Yeah, this is this app that we're looking at here could be completely laid out without any data being pulled in yet. It could and then you could show it to other people. You could publish the app just with the one screen and say this is what it's going to look like. What do you think? What would you change? And then iterate real quickly inside the power app itself um, is really one of the more powerful things you can do. Yep. All right. So Next, we need to discuss business logic and we kind of talked about this earlier when we're talking about Dataverse because this is a really a place where Dataverse really shines when it comes to business rules and validation. Um, so say a scenario where you have a, uh, a field and if that's checked then you want to require approval from someone, right? Um, we can use business rules in Dataverse to enforce that at the data level rather than in the power app. So say we went into power apps and we said, OK, if you click this checkbox then make this field required, right? And you have to fill that in. Uh, we can do that in the power app level, but the problem is what if we're using that data in another power app? You know, maybe we have multiple ones that business validation, that rule isn't applied there, but it can be if we use the business rules that Dataverse offers. Uh, and then finally, output. I um, just want to touch on that briefly. Make sure that you're considering what do I need to do with the data that the app is collecting and where it's going to be stored? Do I need to report off of it? Uh, be mindful of that so that you can make sure that you're architecting your data and your app in a way that the output of the data will be easy to work with and report off of uh, for your requirements. And um, just, just an example of, of what that could look like here um, from an output perspective, we could even use, say, Power Apps and Power Automate together to export data to a CSV if that's part of your requirements so that you could import that into another system or work with it. So lots of possibilities that we have here. Just make sure when you're you know, sketching out your application, your solution, that you're being mindful of what the ultimate output needs to be like. Um, and with that, I think, Greg, you have a great demo lined up here to walk through creating our first Power App. I do, and we're going to, before I jump right in, we'll just kind of go over what we're doing real quick. And you are all at the bottom, aka.ms slash LRN244 slash demo steps. We'll jump you straight out to the place on, on Learn that, that is this demo. So if you want to follow it step by step later, you want to jump straight to it right now, you can do that. But what we're going to look at is downloading an Excel workbook that's got uh, data already in there, ready to go. And then we're going to get that workbook up to OneDrive, connect to that workbook as a data source inside uh, make.powerapps.com. And then we're going to generate an app based on that data source and uh, publish an app so we can run it on a device. That said, let's go ahead and get started. Now I know we're going to run a little short on time, so I'm going to skip over the test. I'm sure nobody minds that. And actually what I'll do is do the demo. How about I do, don't just skip the demo too. All right, um, <laughs> let me bounce right over to Excel. All right, so we're in Excel where we've got some flooring estimate information, just a bunch of product information about the different kinds of flooring that's out there. Uh, different carpet, how much it costs, maybe a picture of it. You know, this picture just points to URL, not the actual picture. That's mostly how these things tend to work. And then some overview text as well. Uh, one thing I want to point out is that this data is formatted as a table. So if I go up to the table design tab here at the very top, we can see it has a table name called flooring estimates. That is the name that Power Apps is going to identify that table by later. So make sure if you if you've created a data source inside Excel that you want to use that you've created it as a table one. Uh, usually you wind up doing that so you can get the, the columns and the sorting and the nice uh, header at the top and all that. But make sure you give it a name that makes sense and not just call it table two or something like that. And just do it in table design, give it a name, hit enter and you're good to go. So I have this Excel sheet. Let me go ahead and get to not Power Apps quite yet. 
get to OneDrive, and I'm just going to drag that file from uh, Windows right into OneDrive here to copy it in. That'll upload that file. So now it's there on uh, OneDrive ready to go. So now uh, it's somewhere Power Apps can get to it. It's on the internet. So let's go back to Power Apps. So I've already got the tab open, but if I go to make.powerapps.com, it does a couple of redirects to give us this nice long URL. Um, but this is Power Apps. But I want to create an app from that data. So let's go ahead and go to the uh, create tab here. Or I'm sorry. Uh, the apps tab. Okay. Right. Two, two tabs. No, I think I've skipped a step. It is actually on the create tab. We're going to start from start from data. We'll go to Excel online. Yep, fine. We're going to use the OneDrive connector to actually talk to that Excel. We find we click on the Excel we uploaded. We see the flooring estimates table that was in there, and we click connect down here at the bottom. We get a circle of patients as the Power Apps editor loads up a nice diagram to let us know that something is doing things and creating that nice app for you. And look at that. We have an app ready to go. And, and this is the editor, so we can click on the individual things. We can see that we're taught looking at the individual image, or if I click on the header, we're looking at the category or the name and so on. And if I click on the play button up here in the upper right hand corner, we can preview that app. And now we can just click around, see what that looks like, click back to go back, scroll. Looks good. And if we search for, say, carpet, we get just the carpet. Looks good. Sounds like it looks like a good app. Let's go ahead and ship it. So I'll just click the X here in the upper right hand corner to close the preview. And to publish this app out, all I need to do is save it. So I'll go to the file menu here at the top, and give it a different name and call it flooring info for this one. Maybe we make it purple because purple is best color and we'll use the magnifying glass as our icon. You can give it a description if you want to and we just come to the save tab over here on the left side. Uh, we have our name we already gave it and down in the lower right hand corner we'll click on save. So we get another circle of patience. It saves that Power App up into the cloud. Make sure you save it at least once before you close your Power Apps tab or else it won't be there. And it gives us a chance to share our app or see all the versions. You want to make sure that you share your app with other users so they can actually get to it themselves. So let's actually click on share. Take a look at that real quick. And that'll bring up that sharing tab. It's already shared with me. I can just say everyone has access to this app. I'm going to talk to Excel and OneDrive and click on share. Now everyone can get to it. So I'll just click in the X to close here and it gives me uh, different information. And if I click on this web link, it'll show me another tab what it looks like for a user running. This should look very familiar. It's the same app. We scroll down. You can look at it. Looks good. Good to go. And now if somebody logs in, runs the Power Apps app on their phone, this is the app they're going to get and they can use it. Pretty wow. good, pretty easy, pretty straightforward. That's awesome. Like three minutes, we have a fully functioning application that we've shared with everyone in our company and that they can use on their desktop, tablet, or mobile. That's pretty cool. It is just that quick to get started, and that's really the power of it is, is how fast something can get out there and get running, and then you can just build on it, add more functionality, um, and so on. So back into PowerPoint here as I reset and now it looks like we do have a little bit of time so we don't get to skip that knowledge check after all let's do one more <laughs> question um, power apps automatically creates three screens for you when you build an app from a data source which we just did which of the following is not one of the screens created this is going to be a little hard because I didn't walk through everything that was in there I just kind of used the app and kind of showed what was there um, but we have four options here we have our browse screen um, that I'm pretty sure we had. That was the, the screen that we started with. That would that really yeah. that home screen. Um, we have a news screen. We have an edit screen. So to edit the details on, on the particular items. And last but not la least, we have a detail screen. I think um, I remember seeing the, the detail screen for sure when you were clicking around there and clicked on an item. That that sounds about right. 
maybe. Yeah, I think so. Now, I'm not, I don't think I went into either a new or an edit screen, but one of them was there and one of them wasn't. So it's kind of a, a coin toss. If you run the app yourself, if you go through the demo and get that app running, you can check it out. But really what it is, uh, if I take a look here, answers are split. It looks like 50% say new screen and survey says new screen. That's yeah. right. There was a little pencil icon there at the top. You click that pencil, that'll get you the edit screen. But if you want a, a screen to create new estimates, that's something you're going to need to learn how to create yourself inside Power Apps. And there's lots of information on Microsoft Learn to help you dig deeper and in, in, into actually creating these, these applications. So we've been through a whole lot. It's been a little over an hour here. And if you have any last questions before we wrap up, definitely get them into the chat now. But what, what, we, what have we done here today? Um, today we, we discovered Power Apps. We walked through what it was like to create your first Power App. Um, we talked about make.powerapps.com. That URL, if you do a, a Power Apps for any amount of time, will be burned into your brain. That is the homepage for Power Apps. Um, there's the Power Apps Studio, that site that you use to actually create your Power Apps and, and uh, configure all the controls and set the fonts and the colors and all that good stuff. That's the Power Apps Studio. And then there's Power Apps Admin Center to create those environments, make sure all the users have access to everything, um, apply security policies if you want to, all that good stuff that probably IT will take care of, maybe not. Um, that's all in the Power Apps Admin Center. And really the power of Power Apps is, is kind of twofold. One, you can create an app yourself very quickly, drag and drop with very little code. Um, but it's it's the, the platform, whether it's Microsoft Dataverse, whether it's Power Automate to do those, those workflows, or whether it's the hundreds and hundreds of data connectors to talk to all the Microsoft stuff, ton of uh, cloud services out there uh, in the world as well, just to automatically bring that in super easy and then talk to those services using that same low code um, really is super powerful. So a couple more uh, slides that I want to get to before we run off. Our resources here, again, the Learn module that, that walks through the same content we've done here today is at aka.ms slash LLRN244. Um, there's a ton of stuff out there on Learn Live. Go to aka.ms slash Learn Live. You can find out all about that. And definitely, 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 please fill out your session evaluation. Help me in April uh, make our sessions better in the future or let us know what we really did super great. Um, all that information is great. Fill out those session information. Um, but one more thing before we go, um, the Cloud Skills Challenge is out there for Microsoft tonight. If you go to mynight.microsoft.com slash learning dash zone, or just click on learning zone there at the top, you can find the Cloud Skills Challenge. And that will let you um, follow a bunch of uh, information on Microsoft Learn, a collection of learning paths that if you follow through and, and do all those learning paths, you'll get a code for uh, Microsoft certification. I'm pretty sure the Power Platform certifications are included in that as well. Great way to get started. You can go out to the website for details. And definitely make sure you join the Learn Live show out on Learn TV um, at aka.ms slash learn live. That's aka.ms slash learn live. Um, so it's going to, they're going to be starting that show here shortly. They're going to be on March 15th. They're going to be uh, starting with Azure SQL fundamentals, but there's uh, like over 2,000 topics in Microsoft Learn now, and they're going to be looking at all of them one at a time for as long as you and I, and more importantly, those hosts can handle it. Uh, <laughs> so that'll be starting March 15th. So mark your calendars. Make sure you check that out, AKMS slash learn live. And... That's all I have for you today, April. I don't know if you want yeah. to add anything to it before we jump to our questions for the last two minutes. Um, no, oh, I just wanted to dive straight into the questions because we have a couple great ones out there. So, yeah, I want to make sure we get to. So, Alex, he asked, uh, could we expand on why we would use Power Apps over Microsoft Forms? Great question um, on that. So, I don't, I'm, I can chime in real quickly on that and see what Greg has to say. Uh, with Microsoft Forms, that's really good for simple scenarios. So, you know, signing up for a potluck dinner. Um, if you need more complex scenarios, uh, that's where Power Apps would be to go to. If you need 
need a lot of conditional logic, like show or hide this field. If you need to pull data from data sources, that's the big distinguishing factor for me. You can't pull data from other data sources into a Microsoft form. So if I needed a drop down that had a list of users from my organization to choose from, that's something that forms couldn't do, but I could do with Power Apps easily. So that's a big distinguishing factor for me. Anything to add there, Craig? Um, and then, uh, so hopefully that answers that one. Um, oh, getting quite a bit. Um, also, Marianne wants to know, is there integrated debugging in Power Apps? Um, that is, it's, there's a couple actually different things that are helpful inside Power Apps. Um, when you're filling out that formula bar up there at the top, um, you can see right there, um, it'll pop in right there, like what the variable, what the value of the variable you're looking at is, or maybe what what the data contained within a, a table or a collection of data is just right there. But there's also the well, the Power Apps monitor that you can run. It pops open in a separate tab to um, see all that data going back and forth between your connectors to make sure that the data you're getting back makes sense, that the query that you're sending out to get back makes sense. So there are, are those uh, information as well. And now, one more question I think we have time for that I'll throw in real quick here is how can you share an app with people outside your company? Right now, your only option is going to be Power Apps Portals. Uh, we didn't talk about that today, but Power Apps Portals is what you want to look at. It can talk to that same data on the back end, but has a different kind of authoring experience to create those websites for folks outside your company, whether it's, you know, it's customers or um, sales leads or anything else. But that's all we have time for today. Thank you very much uh, for coming out and uh, checking out our session. April, do you have anything else you want to add? No, just thank you so much for, for joining our session. I hope you learned all about Power Apps and got inspired to get started. Thanks for joining us and enjoying the rest of Microsoft tonight. <laughs>